Okay, so um, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, SIB virtual computational um, biology seminar series. Today we have the pleasure to host several speakers, uh, Claire Cliva, Marcia Sankar, Sarah Schultes, and Simon Gabet. So I will go briefly through the um, bio. Uh, so Claire Cliva is head of digital humanities plus at the, at the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. She's uh, leading the DH research projects such as Mark 16, the eTalks, or the uh, H2020 Desire project. Um, she's publishing research at the crossroad of the New Testament in digital humanities. And she's a member of several scientific committees and editorial boards. And she's co-leading a, a brief series called Digital uh, Bi 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 Studies. Sorry. Uh, regarding Simon Gabet, after a master's degree in Romance uh, Philology in Paris and St. Andrews, uh, he defended a PhD in Latin Philology at the University of Amsterdam, and is currently working as a postdoc fellow at the University of Neuchâtel, where he is now carrying research on the 16th, uh, 17th century French manuscripts and digital philology. Um, Sarah Schultes is part of the DH uh, Plus Interdisciplinary Team Team with Claire Cliva here at the SIB. She has published several articles on the Arabic manuscripts of the New Testament and digital humanities and defended her PhD uh, thesis on the uh, Arabic manuscripts of the Letters of Paul in 2016. She's currently publishing a research on a Greek Latin Arabic manuscript of the New Testament on the digital platform uh, uh, Umarek as well as working on the uh, EU project Desire. And finally, Marcel Sankar studied biology and computer science uh, at the University of Paris SET. He obtained his master in photomics and bioinformatics at the University of Geneva in 2007 and was enrolled in the company GeneBio, a software solution company for photomic based biomedical application. He joined uh, the IBMS in Strasbourg in 2009 as a data science, scientist in cancer genomics. And he then defended a PhD at the University of Lausanne, uh, studying various plant morphogenetic, morphogenetic phenomena uh, through data analysis and mathematical modeling. And in December 2014, he joined the Vital IT group here at the SIB to work on, on the mega, mega class and the digital humanities also at that time. So today, um, the four of us will tell us more on how the field of humanities is benefiting from bioinformatics practices and how these practices are contributing to the development of digital human of digitized humanities. So um, I want to welcome you again and the stage is yours. Thank you, Okay, today uh, it's a special uh, SIB virtual computational biology seminar series. Uh, because we are not going to talk about computational biology or bioinformatics. We are going to talk about digital humanities. And we are going also to introduce you our new group, DH Plus, for Digital Humanities Plus. The group is led by Claire Cliva. For the moment, it's a small group. Uh, there's two people, there's me and, and Sarah. We will be joined in April by uh, Nina Monnier uh, from UK. And we hope uh, that Simon Gabe, who is here today, will also join us uh, this year uh, because he has deposit an ambition project to work on its own uh, on, I, on project ID under the umbrella of DH. So I will start with a short introduction, uh, and then each one of us here are going to present you a product or an ongoing project uh, where it's involved. In. And finally, Simon is going to show us what he's doing, uh, what he's working on in Neuchâtel, and maybe we'll give a few words about uh, his next project. But first, first of all, I would like to start with a small uh, story. It's the story of the blind monks and the elephant. The story starts with a group of monks who wanted to know the shape of an elephant only based their feeling when they touch it. Why? Because they are blind. Okay. And so one of them is going to touch, for example, the tusk of the elephant. He's going to say, yeah, it's, it's sharp. Maybe it's a sword or a blade. Another one is going to touch the body of the, of the elephant. 
and it's going to say, yeah, it's strong and solid, so maybe it's a, it's a rock or a stone, a stone wall. Another, another one is going to touch, for example, the leg of the elephant, and it's going to say, yeah, it's vertical, it's strong, it's maybe a tree trunk. And for us, it's easy, actually, because we can see the shape of the object, or the shape of the animal. But for them, they cannot see, it's more complicated. What they could have done, for example, is simply talking with the neighbors, exchanging ideas and hypotheses regarding the shape of the animal. And you can imagine each of these monks to be a field of science, like mathematics, informatics, humanities, biology. And that's what we are doing here, actually. We are trying to enable the crosstalk between bioinformatics and humanities. And bioinformatics, by the way, is already a crosstalk between biology and computer science and informatics. And this is more uh, a biological network representation we are maybe more familiar with uh, uh, of a, what is a crosstalk. So you have two components, the I for bioinformatics, the H for digital humanities. I will come uh, back to the question mark uh, just after uh, defining you what is humanities. Humanities is defined by Stanford uni Universities as the study of how people are processing and documenting the human experience. And since humans have been able, they use tools, okay, we use tools like philosophy, musicology, theology, religion, arts, in order to understand and record the world. It's a definition that I like a lot because I find it very complementary to what we are doing uh, in life science, for example, where we are aiming to explain life system and being able to predict it using, for example, mathematical model. And more and more, humanities is going digital. So we are talking and going towards digitized humanities. Why? Because humanities uh, is going through a massive digitization of its raw materials, leading to a huge amount of data and some needs for tools, computational tools, statistics, methods, and visualization, for example. And you can compare it to what happened to biology 30 years ago with the advances of sequencing technologies, which try to emblematic database, such as EMBL database or SwissProt, and also tools like BLAST, right? And in Vital IT, that's what we did uh, during this for last year, actually trying to exchange our experience from bioinformatics with colleagues from humanities. In terms of methods and tools, mining, visualization, and technological transfer, technological knowledge. But we noticed that there was one fundamental difference between science, biology, bioinformatics, and science like humanities is that the nature of the data is different. So we are more used to deal with quantitative information and more and more with next, next generation sequencing technology and high throughput technologies, whereas humanities, it stays, it remains qualitative mostly. That's the data we have in humanities. So for example, it's manuscripts. Uh, the one on the left is from Codex Arabicus. The other one is a, is a trilingual manuscript, Greek, Latin, and uh, an Arabic uh, from the Marshana Library. And for some people here, you can say it's images. So it's a big matrix of cell intensity values. Right? But it's true. Because depending on the question, for example, if you are interested to, uh, to character recognition or to automatically uh, detect the verses, the, the, the limit, delimitation of the verses, that's the way you are going to use it, using numbers and matrix. But the question that humanities researchers are, are asking is lying at the core of the manuscript. They are interested by the meanings of the verses, the meanings of the words. That they are interested to the purposes. They are 
characteristic to the historical context. And all the aspects that are really, um, how to say, related to human experience. And this is something that I, uh, in my opinion, is really uh, present in the work of biocurators, curators, or more in, in, in biomedical, for example, the work of experts like pathologists, maybe, uh, but to skills, actually, to score skills, they are valuable. And uh, big companies like, for example, Google's, Google, they notice that and they are bypassing the current, uh, the traditional, uh, let's say, the traditional academic channels to create a new discipline that mix humanity skills with data science. And data science is already a mix of skills. And why they are doing that? Because they noticed the importance and the role of intuition, intuition purposes, meanings for decision making to help human make decisions. And I invite you to read uh, this, uh, this article. It's from uh, Fast Company. It's a famous uh, tech and business journal in the US. More concretely, what we are doing uh, in, uh, in DHS, one of our products, is the eTalk. The eTalk, uh, the concept of the eTalk was developed by Claire Cliva and Frédéric Kaplan five years ago in, in a PFL. And it was deployed here in Vital IT before I arrived, actually, by Nicolas Budin and Ioannis Zenarios. And it looks like that. So you have the, the images of the slides. You have the, the speeches that is written. And you can hear the, the, the author talking, actually. You can, you can hear the, the author speech. And this is an example from, uh, from SIB, from Frédéric Schultz, on personalized medicine. And one of the features that we are proposing with the with the eTalk is a possibility to cite each portion of the of the author sp author speeches uh, with cross link and references. And uh, during the last four years in Vital IT and now in DH Plus, we have a series of five eTalks, uh, five uh, series of eTalks, with 22 distinct authors for a total of 28 he talks and almost 800 minutes of recorded speech. We got nice achievements. And last year, for the context of the course, uh, we used Docker and virtualization solution in order to package the application and make it used by students and, uh, and, uh, and people in the workshop. And we also released a complete training uh, on the eTalk that is available on Daria Teach. Uh, Claire is going to, to talk uh, a little more about that uh, just later. But this, uh, this technology, Docker, and this kind of virtualization may, make us think about kind of new editorial model, maybe, where you can ship uh, the eTalk application that is encapsulated inside the Docker image to end user. It can be students, it can be scholars. They can edit their own eTalk in front of their computer. They can do whatever they want uh, to publish it on Amazon Cloud or whatever. Or they can simply uh, come back to us for review or editorial validation. It is not just a, a, a concept idea. It's something that we are experimenting and, and, and developing uh, into several collaborations, for example, with publisher. And we are still using it uh, internally. Actually, you and Claire developed two uh, different e-talks on Mark 16, uh, one in French and one in, one in English. And she's going to tell us about this project now. Thank you, Marcel. So now, Mark 16. Mark 16 is a Prima grant project, so five years. Um, and what is the classical uh, enigma of Mark 16.8? Potentially, the gospel according to Mark could finish with this sentence in 16.8. So the woman went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement assized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. 
if it's like that, it means that the second gospel uh, in the Bible could finish without the appearance of uh, the resurrected Jesus. So it puzzled uh, researchers uh, since centuries, I can say. Um, all the more that we have different manuscripts at the end of this gospel, with, uh, as you can see, it's a list of different endings. So it's a recurrent enigma in New Testament textual criticism. Now, with digital humanities, we face a very important epistemological term for humanities, and I can show it for, for this project. Notably, we can look at the manuscripts online, and it changes deeply the field of the textual criticism. Uh, we are attentive to the material of the research, and so for Mark 16, we have no papyrus evidence of it, no attestation before the 4th century, and uh, Mark 16 ends in 16.8 only in three manuscripts, the two uh, oldest one, O1 and O3, and the minuscule 304, 12th century. So according to Keith Elliott, the scribes of O1 and O3 were aware that the ending of Mark was disputed. And thankful to the wonderful Codex Vaticanus we can now see online and even download images, we can check it quite directly because as you see, as you see here, there is a full empty column at the end of the Gospel according to Mark, normally uh, used to show that this Gospel could end here. And we can share with Keith Elliott that it is um, not a hazardous because all the other Gospels or other texts in New Testament finish with a not empty column. You have the other Gospel directly written uh, on, on the last third column, for example. So it's time to come back to this enigma. And I totally share the opinion of the French historian François Artaud. Is it possible to write history from the point of view of both the losers and the winners? Or with some French words, nevertheless. Alors que l'histoire des vainqueurs ne voit qu'un seul côté, le sien, celle des vaincus doit, pour comprendre ce qui s'est passé, prendre en compte les deux côtés. Une histoire des témoins ou des victimes peut-elle faire droit à cette exigence qu'emporte avec elle le très vieux mot d'historia? So what I want to do with Mark 16 is to show the diversity of the manuscript, that means the diversity of opinions in early Christianity about the end of this text. And so we are building a, a new research model in humanities, a virtual research environment that hopefully will be launched at the end of 2019 to, to start uh, the platform. It could look like that. Thank you to Martial for the mock-up. It will be, in my mind, a reference portal on Mark 16 with as much as possible, depending on the copyright, the material necessary for research on it. A manuscript rooms with several folios of Mark 16, uh, an interpretation tool, it's a new tool, I, I will come back to it, and also uh, data map visualizations. We have several collaborations for that. For example, with, uh, for the data map, we will collaborate with Pelagios, um, who is an important project in UK, and we rely strongly on our scientific committee to get input to have feedbacks from users, students, colleagues from other places. In this VRA, we will include multimodal scholarly productions, and it is something really new to, to want to, to get also multimodal material, because usually we quote only articles and books. But it's very interesting, for example, here in this video of the Bible Odyssey project, to compare what a scholar is saying by oral, with rhetorical, pathos, ethos, uh, and the stuff, and in a written article. So it belongs also to the research to try to integrate all the intellectual productions about Mark 16. 2013-2023 has been called by Candela, Castelli, and Pagano the VRE's decade. So um, Mark 16 is exactly coming at the five years of this decade. And they give the following um, definition of a VRA that fits perfectly for Mark 16. It's a web-based working environment tailored uh, to serve the needs of community of practice uh, and expected to, to be in contact to provide uh, services to this community. 
It's open and flexible uh, for, for its lifetime, and it promotes fine grain control sharing of both intermediate and final research results by guaranteeing ownership, provenance, and attribution. So we are following all this important feather of a VRE in Mark 16 and going even beyond of that, uh, notably thanks to the Swiss National Foundation um, that has established, as you know, it's a good practice to have a data management plan for all the new submitted projects. And so we are in touch uh, with um, Humanum for their service uh, Nakala and um, uh, AL. And we are figuring to depose our data at the end of the project on their open depository. So it belongs also to the very spirit to go until uh, the data curation, data preservation, also on a long-term point of view. So our interpretation tool will be something to compare efficiently the different opinions in a project. And of course, uh, in the middle of the opinions, I will uh, develop my own hypothesis about Mark 16, as well as our postdoc who arrives in April. Um, but the main point is really to show the diversity and to allow to the users to go in the material and to build their own hypothesis about Mark 16. So you have here the team, and we are looking forward to, to welcome Ina in April. That's for Mark 16. Now the H2020 project this year. So this H2020 project is led by Daria, the Eric in Digital Humanities, and the CIB has been involved since the beginning in it. Uh, to um, lead notably, as far as possible, the Swiss candidature to become a full DARIA member under the umbrella of the Swiss Academy of Humanities and Social Sciences, who uh, that has started a consortium at the end of October, DARIA CH. So we are working um, on a firm basis at the Swiss right towards the direction of uh, this integration. This year is led by 17 partners, and we are very pleased to have welcomed the University of Neuchâtel with Mathieu Neger and, and Simon Gabet on the road. Uh, its, its purpose is to strengthen the sustainability of DARIA with several um, initiatives and projects, and notably by organizing events, uh, dissemination events, and we are precisely in the road, on the road to, to continue that. And uh, six countries like us are accessing countries in this project, Israel, Finland, uh, Spain, the UK, and so on. And so we try to, to go in the sense to uh, go in Daria. And uh, the idea is also to disseminate all the useful tools that Daria is providing to researchers and for infrastructure research. We have opened, uh, thank you, Martial, a great uh, DH plus Desir blog where you can find all the news, what uh, was happened in the past, for example, um, a very great, so the CIBA has become a Daria cooperating partner uh, in November, important point, and in Neuchâtel happened the Daria CH workshop led by Mathieu Honegger and Simon Gabet and the team, and it was really an important event with the um, colleagues from all the Switzerland, from Europe, uh, also political implications. And um, we are trying to, to be strongly in touch with the European research for digital humanities. Why does it matter? Why does it matter for Switzerland to be in link, in strong link with the European research? I take the example of all access publications to answer to this question, as you may have heard the coalition S at the European level has started a plan, a plan S, to hopefully uh, get open access for all the fields as reality in 2020. So it's a very ambitious program, and the Swiss National Foundation supports it and would like to try to get all the publications produced by the researchers at SNF uh, in OR uh, at the time. But of course, it's a so huge evolution that all the partners have to be involved in. And um, notably uh, at the governing board of the European Association in uh, Humanities and Social Science Sciences, we are preparing a round table with publishers, that's the so important actors of the questions, researchers, 
and different associations. Um, and we propose a um, draft answer to, to the Plan S. And uh, of course, at the European Association of Digital Humanities, it's also a topic of discussion. So for Switzerland, it's absolutely crucial to be in strong relationship with the European level as the European research, not only for digital humanities. And so we are happy to foster our relationship to Daria. And now I come to the current uh, DESIR uh, project at the CIB. We will be giving a, a lecture with Simon uh, in Paris in, in, in of May. And now um, I pass the word to Sarah, who will speak to you to the DIMPO project. Um, <clears throat> So a few um, more words about uh, Daria and the CIB involvement. Uh, one of the work group of Daria is DIMPO, uh, namely um, the Digital Methods and Practice uh, uh, Observatory. And this work group aims to develop and provide an evidence-based uh, account of the emerging information practices, needs, and attitudes um, of art and humanities researchers. And uh, we had a first survey um, released in 2016, and a second survey is now in preparation. And as an active partner, we propose in collaboration with the University of uh, Zurich um, to extend the uh, inquiry uh, about the digital practices in um, uh, the, project, the digital practices in humanities in Switzerland uh, by focusing on one particular group in the human humanities, namely uh, the theology, religious uh, study field, uh, which is the field, uh, my, my study field. Um, it will be interesting and innovative to focus on one group and we will be able to compare the results with the European uh, results to ask specific questions reg regarding, for example, the, use, the digital use of religious scriptures, and in this way to underline uh, specificities uh, for, for the field uh, of theology and religious studies. Uh, now let me present another project of our team, uh, the project UMAREC. It is a SNF project that runs over two years, uh, and it is in some aspects still uh, ongoing. The purpose uh, of this project is to test a model of continuous publishing for the humanity. And for that, the project focuses on one particular object that uh, Martial already mentioned, a manuscript con containing part of the Bible uh, and written in three languages, in Greek, Latin, and Arabic. And we study specifically the pages containing the letters of Paul. Uh, the idea of continuous publishing is that we wanted to make each step uh, of our research available uh, online, and for that we have developed several focus areas. First of all, we have worked on the best uh, visualization option for the manuscripts, and its text also. Secondly, the research work on the manuscript itself um, was published on our website, uh, little by little, through regular blog posting. And uh, also, the continuous publishing pro concept also relies on the possibility to change and to correct the data and the result after an interaction with the readers. And for that, uh, we have um, a forum on the website. Uh, also, we communicate also on Facebook and on Twitter, in addition to uh, the usual talks and papers at uh, meetings. And finally, we have created a format that is more like book-alike, um, uh, the so-called web book. This is uh, where the research done during the project was and is still uh, uh, communicated in a more synthetic way. And the benefits of the webbook is that, in contrast to, uh, 
to, for example, to an ebook, to a static ebook, it has been designed in relation to our project website and in relation to other online resources. And it is also integrated the continuous process. Um, uh, it was started and made available already during our project, and I, and I am still now updating uh, and writing in the, in the web book. And also, uh, we keep the different versions of the, of the work, and the versioning aspect is available for the readers, as it is something that is quite interesting for, for a book. <coughs> and um, finally, we are collaborating for the web book with an established academic publisher, Brill, and uh, they will organize at the, at the end of the process a peer review, and in case of positive review, uh, will become our publisher and host, host a web book on their website. And this last aspect is very interesting because publishers, particular, particularly in the humanities, are normally quite rel reluctant to, uh, to new models. And uh, we are very happy that they consider our project as a, uh, a valuable model. So that's uh, all for me and uh, for Umaret. And I give the floor to my colleague Simon Gabet, who will uh, tell you more about manuscripts. Thank you, Safa. So, I'm um, going to talk about projects uh, about manuscripts. And the Sévigné starts with uh, something that is quite famous, it's the Exception Française, uh, once again, it's another one. The French people tend to do things very differently for some reason than the rest of the planet. And for 17th century French texts, it's particularly true. Um, first thing is that when they did text, they rarely uh, look at manuscripts, which is a big problem, but also they're not helped because there is no catalog for such documents. So from which do we take the original text if I want to edit something? The second thing is that they completely normalize the old spelling and they make it like contemporary French, and therefore they are rarely studying what is the original text. The third thing is that they are usually forgetting what philology is, and thus not realize the two aforementioned points. So I would like to use digital philology as a way to go back to philology, which is the science of the text, and particularly the science of studying manuscripts, and to try to reread 17th century French text through digital philology, which is philology. Uh, so I'm here to talk about an FNS project that has been funded during two, uh, 2015 and 2018 and is now continuing with a new position at the University of Neuchâtel. It's been uh, co-directed by two professors, Marc Escola, specialist of 17th century French, and uh, Alain Corbellari, professor of uh, medieval literature. And uh, there were two posts, talk to me and one that I, that I thank him who yesterday put the last version of the, the, the website online. And we decided to test this idea about philology and 17th century French manuscripts on Madame de Sévigné, which is one of the most famous writers of the Grand Siècle. So to give you an idea, a manuscript looked like that. And the first step, which was the most complex, was to try to identify manuscripts which were scattered everywhere on the globe. And luckily, I've been able to find new manuscripts, unknown manuscripts, and also manuscripts that hadn't been seen except in printed version, which is the case of this one. This is very interesting because finding new manuscripts help us read them differently. For instance, here, if we have a look, we'll see that in the upper part of the manuscript, the letter is written by Madame de Sévigné, but in the lower part of the manuscript, it's written by her daughter, Madame de Grignan, which is very interesting because until now, the entire letter has been considered written by Madame de Sévigné, which means that we can reattribute who wrote what in the letter, which is interesting in a way that we can interpret more precisely what is in the text. The other interesting thing is that going back to the manuscript help us provide valuable graphic, linguistic and literary evidences that help us read the document once again differently. If we have a quick look on this manuscript, we will clearly see that in the upper part and in the lower part we have two different graphic systems, two different ways to write, to write French. The upper part we see the word pauvre, which is written P-A-U-U-R-E, and sujet, S, which is a long S, U-I-E-T, 
both times they use u rather than v and i rather than j, which is a pretty ancient way to write. If we look at the lower part, we see that d'une, the apostrophe u and a we would write in French, is written with the u at the beginning, while her mother would use a v at the beginning, because the v is always at the beginning and the u is always inside the words. Same thing with that mark, where we see the apostrophe that the mother would never use. So, be writing at the reading of the manuscript, we can see that there are two parts in the way they write the form of the letter, the hands that we call it, and also the spelling system, the letters that are chosen rather than others, and these help us understand the text better. Because we're doing digital philology, not only philology, we try to transfer all this information into code. And the most famous way to do it for digital editions called TEI, as we can see here, where we have chosen to go for a pretty high granularity, where each word is encoded, tokenized, lemmatized, postact with more information about people that are inventivized to IDs, and also hand shifting paragraphs, which help us to carry research at a level that was impossible before, both at the same time on the old version, but also on the modernized version, because you can see in the code that sometimes you have a markup choice that helps you choose between origin reg, original version, and regularized version. So website now is online. It's a beta version. Uh, the last one was uh, published yesterday. We hope to publish the final version the beginning of February, and then we will slowly start slowly to publish more and more documents. Uh, the ID looks like that, so it's the exact same information that we've seen before, except that now we can read it with many information, with like the manuscripts and the like, facsimile on the left, but also information on the right with red color when there is a problem in the correction, purple when an abbreviation has been expanded, but also green when text has been added, and we can precise if the document were added or the lines were added in the margin, above or under the line, which once again help us understand better documentation. But what is more interesting is that not only finding documents, but we have to find the history of documents. So this letter was written from Paris to Grignan in 1690, which moved out. Then we know that it was given in Monaco by a descendant of Madame de Sévigné to someone called Madame Rosenhagen. The letters start moving slightly more south which is a, a, a logic way for a manuscript to move on the map, because rich people at the end of the 18th century are on the Riviera, and they start collecting photographs, and they meet all the aristocrats, and they ask, do you have a manuscript of this person or this person? They start collecting things. Then the manuscript keeps moving. It becomes the property of British politician Harry Gray Bennett, who died in 1836 in Italy, but it's most likely probably that the manuscript stayed in London because it was sold in 1904 by Sotheby. Then the manuscripts start moving north, which is once again very interesting because we can see that now collections are well established and that London becomes a hub for manuscripts, where all the manuscripts of France and Italy start being collected and you can still find many, many documents in London and Oxford, which help us find manuscripts, because we know how they move, so we have an idea where to look for them. But the history of the document, once again, does not stop. And in sold in 1904, and was most probably bought by an American poetess called Amy Lowell, who, when she died in 1925, bequeathed to the Library of Harvard Hoyle Manuscript, which is why now the manuscript moved overseas and in the US, which is once again another way to help us find documents because we know that they moved to the US and actually we can find manuscripts of Madame de Sévigny in Washington, Cleveland, Harvard, Boston and many other places in the US and around Europe. This is very interesting again because when you start looking for manuscript in the history of document, you try to document this history, but when we have a catalog of sale documents, you have many documents that have been sold. And sometimes you find another document of Madame de Sévigné. And when I was in London looking at catalogs, I found this document, which is very interesting. It's a Précieuse Autographe Art et Littérature. It's a sale catalog that was sold in 92 in Paris. But the problem is that catalogs are scattered around the world and not properly collected. So it was easier to access this in London. And we see that there is a rare lettre inédite à son homme d'affaires relative à sa terre du bureau. La terre du bureau being her land that she owns in Brittany. And Luckily enough, with the, dog, with the catalog, we had the facsimile of this letter, which is 
new. If you buy the letters of Madame de Sévigné, you will never find it, which shows us that history of document helps us locate manuscripts, but also new manuscripts that help us understand things, but also read text that we had never seen, and that editions can always be improved. So documents have now been published online on uh, my blog, on which I try try to publish documents that I found pretty much anywhere in the world. You will find new letters of Pierre Bay, you will find letters of Madame de Lafayette that has never been seen before. And which leads us to two circles that I think that are very interesting, is that the idea of reconstructing the history of manuscripts helped us find new manuscripts. But also that improving the quality of edition forces us to find new manuscripts, which in its turn help us improve the quality of documents. And there is a virtuous circle that is held by digital philology and like locating documents. So now uh, what are we doing and what are we plan to do is the first thing is connecting our cell catalog database to our edition. It should be done in June. We're working on it. It's going to be published in the summer. And also enlarge the scope to various authors of 17th century French that have said Madame de Sévigné was only a test case. If it works for Madame de Sévigné, connecting history of document, publishing documents, it can be enlarged and add many other authors like Bossuet, Racine, Boileau, and many others. And the third thing that is very important is to provide tools for digital analysis of non-normalized 17th century French texts, because as I've said, most of the texts are normalized, which means that we don't have any digital tools like lematization, post tags, and many other things that prevents us from studying from the digital point of view, uh, the language of the 17th century, and I hope that I will achieve that in the following month or years if I have the project that uh, Marcia mentioned at the beginning, and then I probably give you the, uh, probably the possibility to end the seminar. Or... <laughs> oh. So thank you very much for listening to us, and. Uh, Questions. <laughs>